Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this panel on the US election fallout. Though I have to say, <laughs> given the atmosphere today, it's, it doesn't feel like moderating a panel but presiding over a wake. Uh, I had some questions lined up, but perhaps we should discuss best how to stockpile food and find shelter for the next four years. <laughs> First, we are privileged to have with us Shailene Woodley, a multi-award winning actress and founder of the Up To Us campaign that uh, basically encouraged young people to hear their voices heard politically to get out there. We also have Bradley Tusk, the CEO and founder of Tusk Holdings, who also served as campaign manager for Michael Bloomberg's successful 2009 re-election bid for mayor. And finally, my fellow Brit Owen Jones, a highly successful order and luminary of the British journalism world. Trump has won, and he's done so running a campaign that has broken all the rules of civilised political norms. He's done so defying yet again the pollsters, insulting pretty much everything, pretty much every minority, not to mention 50% of the population in women. Now Trump is obviously not the cause, but the effect of something much deeper. So my first question is, how did he do it? Millions upon millions of people voted for him. What in the end, and it could be various things, do you count for this almost unbelievable victory? I'll start with you, Owen. I genuinely, genuinely regard this as the biggest calamity to perform the Western world uh, since the war. Uh, a unhinged, white nationalist, racist, misogynistic demagogue who is now the president of the last remaining superpower. The reason that's happened, I think, is multi, multi, uh, multiple reasons. But across the Western world, there's massive discontent and anger that's been building for many, many years, and it's going in two different directions. Either a politics based on hope, challenging powerful interests at the top of society, or blaming your neighbour. And this right-wing populism says, don't blame the bankers who plunged us into economic disaster, don't blame the tax dodgers who don't pay their taxes, don't, pay the, don't blame the companies who don't pay you proper wages, instead blame the immigrant, the Muslim, the person next door, the poor person, rather than the powerful. Uh, and it's, it's a lethal politics of fear that's not just in the United States, I've seen it in my own country, Britain, had much to do with the reason Britain left the European Union, we've seen it in France with the rise of the far-right National Front as well. And I think in the United States, of course, we've got to look at racism uh, and the role that's played. Uh, Trump won a massive, a large majority across all white demographics almost, including amongst women. Uh, also, the, and we've seen misogyny against Hillary Clinton, but the reality is her candidacy was seen as an establishment campaign at a time when people are angry with the establishment. And Donald Trump is a plutocrat who wants us to blame all the wrong people, but he positioned himself as the anti-establishing candidate. So finally, those of us who believe in a politics of hope, we've got to wise up now. This is a massive existential threat to the entire West, and until we take on the racism and sexism and all the rest, but also address the economic grievances driving the politics of fear, then we will be swept away, and we can't allow that to happen. The politics of hope has to be victorious after this. Excellent. Wow. I also think that people in America are done with the two-party system in a, in a lot of cases. And when you, when you talk about Trump, it's not just Republicans who, and independents who voted for Trump. It wasn't even that a lot of people voted for Trump necessarily. I think a lot of people just stayed home, which in the end ended up uh, delivering us this wonderful <laughs> new situation that we have. Yeah. Bradley. I say that with sarcasm, obviously. That's right. So there's the anger, there's the disaffection, there's the utter, utter, utter cluelessness by the elites, combined with, and this is, you know, American voters don't like it when someone runs for office saying, it's my turn. We had an entire revolution against your country a couple hundred years ago because we didn't like the idea that just someone gets to be in charge of their turn, and Hillary Clinton's only real argument was, I want it, it's my turn. And that kind of candidate, whether it's Al Gore, or John Kerry, or Bob Dole, or John McCain, they always lose because it pisses people off. And then on top of that, Look, I voted for Hillary, but nonetheless, she has been living by a set of rules for 25 years that no one else is able to live by, and it pisses people off. So if you take a combination of the anger and disaffection, the utter cluelessness by the elites that not only missed it, it probably helped cause the problem in the first place, an incredibly flawed candidate, and then, you know, there's some level of sexism. If Hillary Clinton was exactly the same person but a man, does she win last night? I don't know, because she actually lost her upper college by quite a bit, but 
it's a lot closer at the very least. So it's a number of factors. The world's seven and a half billion years old or something like that. Uh, United States is a couple hundred years old. Whether it's four years or eight years, yes, uh, he seems like an utter buffoon. Do I think the Republic will survive? Yeah, I suspect it will. Picturing Hillary as a man, but I always think it's more instructive to imagine if Donald Trump were a woman with three, three, three marriages, all the various things he had done. I think that's where you re really sit. Now, in what was possibly the sanest thing I've ever seen Donald Trump say, his uh, acceptance speech wasn't the gloat fest I thought it was going to be, but was by his standards fairly reasonable. Now, even he talked about the need to heal the nation, he accepted the divides, he talked about being a president for all Americans, laughably so in my opinion, but this is the rhetoric he used. Now, I am very interested, I mean, my, my full time book, on the impact of social media in all this, particularly in politics. You see it in conflict as well, Russia, Ukraine, but if you look at something like, let's say, Twitter, which was actually, in essence, Trump's campaign's mouthpiece, it was just Trump. Now, social media brings people together, but it also divides them. We are all a slave to the Facebook algorithm. It curates content that you like, the people you follow, your friends are, are generally like-minded. We now live in self-perpetuating echo chamber bubbles. Now, how can you heal a nation that is being driven ever more far apart by social media? I think, I mean, the United States is an astonishingly polarised country. Yeah. Like, look, my own country is astonishingly polarised. And that manifests itself on social media, but it reflects those divisions. You can argue it, it exacerbates them, but the reality is most people aren't on Twitter talking about politics. Anyway, millions of people who voted for Donald Trump aren't tweeting about no. Donald Trump. They're probably not even talking about him on Facebook. Many of them don't even have access to broadband. Disproportionately, uh, they don't actually. So I think, yes, obviously, the United States is a very divided nation. Social media is not exactly that conducive to rational balance, no, it's not. even handed debate, that's true. But I think it's, a, it's what we see on social media, the wars mm. are just another battleground, and those wars are being fought in lots of other battlegrounds. They curate the news that we receive, is my point. But, okay, and Shelley? You know, well, I would just argue, first off, that I think mainstream media was Trump's true uh, mouthpiece, because yeah. whether it was good press or bad press, it was still press. And every time you turned on the television, you went to an airport, you went to any public arena, you on any radio, they were talking about Trump. So you constantly had his name in the back of your mind, rolling, rolling, rolling. Um, so that's one thing to talk about. And then with social media, you know, it is, I probably shouldn't talk about this because I actually engaged in social media for the first time this year because of this political campaign. Um, but I find that you kind of can curate what you are interested in, what you're not interested in. So I don't know that it further divides, but you do establish um, a community. But there is also the opportunity to receive opinions that you wouldn't normally receive in your day-to-day -day interactions due to the fact that we don't really have many day-to-day -day interactions that involve verbal languages anymore because social media dominates so much of our lives. But I think you're right, the danger is an echo chamber where people create their own bubble Full of people reinforced. This is a very do real phenomenon. Not do that anyways, if it was if it was outside of social media, right? If we were in a community existing without technology, would people not create sort of their own? Look, you're more likely in your workplace to meet people, for example, with different opinions. Even your family's might have people with different opinions. Exactly. But on social media, there is the danger that you create a bubble. You all speak in the same way. Yeah, but Trump, Trump didn't win because he was good at. Twitter. But this is not about him yeah, winning or losing. But, but the idea that it's it's about the yeah, but there, there's, of the not, there's not a hack that all of a sudden solves this problem. Right? The problem is that half of our country, maybe more, feels really disaffected and really pissed off, and until someone does something about it, it's not going to change. And there's not some curating solution. It's neither causing the problem nor is it the solution to the problem. It goes a lot deeper than that. I think it's an informational problem as well. As far as the way the world looks at America, listen, when we talk about what Trump is going to do to America and the fact that our republic could survive for the next four to eight years potentially, you really have to, we have to realize that this is an international issue. Right? We're, we're on the brink of so many changes around the world, whether it's 120 million refugees, whether whatever these statistics are, all of these different um, issues are coming to the surface. And having a political leader such as Donald Trump, um, I don't have the answers to that, but it is something that we have to seriously pay attention to and something that we seriously need to start connecting with our allies outside of America on a different level that's not just governmental in order to make sure not only we hold our politicians accountable, but on a global level that we're able to hold our politicians accountable. We don't care. I may care, Shailene cares, but 90% of the U.S. 
doesn't know you exist, they don't care what you think about them. America's standing in the world means nothing to them. And the fact that the U.S. moves really large to you, but you don't exist at all in the American's mind. And so like, for as long as you keep thinking about it as, how do Americans feel about this? You're missing the underlying point. They don't care at all. So most of the world will say, look at America and see a country where most voters got what offered an unhinged, as far as people can tell, psychopathic, uh, racist, misogynist demagogue, and they went, we like that, we're gonna make him president. And that is something which, the experience today of waking up to that is never going to go away. Whether or not Americans care, America's international standing or perceptions of it do matter because it is the sole hegemon, it is the guarantor of the liberal Western order. Um, folks, does that exist what, anymore? Well, I mean, does the liberal Western order exist anymore? I think well, it died. That's a question. That's a question. We can say it died last time. I mean, let's see. So, we have Trump. The executive, the legislature now is Republican. We've got to toss up with the Supreme Court judges. Trump is going to nominate, obviously, a conservative one. A couple of the liberal judges, I think, are in their 80s. So we could talk about the judiciary as well. Now, were we talking now about a Republican stranglehold on all branches of government? And if so, what do you foresee happening over the next eight years? Uh, when Obama took office, Democrats controlled the House, the Senate, and the White House two years later totally changed. If there's one constant thing, it's that in the midterm elections, the president of the party tends to get wiped out in the elections. I would be shocked if we didn't have uh, a change in power too. Okay. Oh yeah, the Democrats are going to start busting their asses this morning <laughs> to make sure that 2018 looks very different than uh, what we saw last night. Do you think this is a real setback for feminism? Do you see it as that? I don't think you can judge some one person as a setback for feminism. Feminism is a movement. And movements move because people on the ground are dedicated to them. Not because you have the thought in this office, not even because you have a female president in office. Feminism is people like you and I who stand up every single, well, maybe not you guys, but <laughs> yes, you guys. But people who stand up, who identify themselves as a feminist and who say, I'm empowering myself as a woman, or as a man I empower and I stand in solidarity with this movement. Yes. Um, in order to change the paradigm and the narrative of not only the way women exist in the world, but also in the way women think about themselves, and the way women um, take steps in their own lives. And so, would Hillary Clinton have progressed the feminist movement? I think it would have been an amazing opportunity to inspire a lot more people. Exactly. But I don't think that it's going to halt the feminine movement. I don't think it's hurt the feminine movement. And if anything, I think it's going to inspire and empower a lot more people now to wake up and realize that we have a lot more work to do and we better start realizing that if we don't do it, no one will. Hey, Trump will be the wake up. And he's someone who's quite happily taught, you know, in military briefings, he was asking why the US hasn't used nuclear bombs. Uh, since World War II during conflict. Uh, this is a guy with access obviously now to the nuclear code. Yeah. Oh, sorry, from January. Yeah. Uh, he's going to you know, potentially start a trade war with China. Uh, I mean, you know, the Republicans in, in, in Congress might try and block that because they're free traders. But actually, because he doesn't respect democratic norms, which I think is why the Republic is challenged by this, if they try and block it, I think he will mobilise people in the streets uh, to put pressure on them in, in quite a menacing way. I think we will see that. So I think you'll see, you know, I think Putin, I, I think Putin probably woke up feeling pretty cheery uh, this morning as well. Uh, I think it will obviously destabilise international relations. It's difficult to see. I, look, things will get better, by the way. I know this is depressing. <laughs> but you do have to try and find glimmers of hope. And we do have someone who's a demagogue in the White yeah. House who is speaking in a very militaristic way and is promoting conflict. Well, what's interesting to think about, because for all of Trump's flaws, he's not stupid, right? And in many ways, his economic yeah. argument, Shailene, we were talking about this backstage, is not that different than what Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, sure. and a lot of others are saying too. Yeah. Does he try to form some sort of coalition with them, even if it's very implicit to say, you don't believe in TPP, neither do I. You don't believe in NAFTA, neither do I. And you could see a real retreat by the United States on an economic level, but it may not be Trump rallying people in the streets. It could actually be 
the far left and the far right joining together um, against the center. I, I, I don't know if he's sophisticated enough to pull that off, but he pulled off a pretty big one last night, so I wouldn't put it past him. But we cannot let fear get in the way of progress, because that is the second that all of our fears actually become a true reality. So I just wanted to throw that out there for moving forward throughout our days even. If we can be aware of where we're allowing fear to halt our, our, our limitations and our language when it comes to the progress of not only America, but on a global level as well, and the impact on a global level, and where we can be realistic and yet also positive and um, start creating solutions for this issue that is now, you know, in the laps of all of us, whether you live in America or not. So, uh, upsetting. I found myself almost bursting in tears a couple of times this morning. Embarrassed in many ways to be here in Europe in the middle of all this. But with that said, in some ways, the more that you guys attack the United States, the more I feel myself sort of defending what happened last night. Um, we're not attacking the U.S., attacking Trump. But, but he's part of the United States, and we're a very strong country, and the reality is we will survive. He may do some really stupid things, but odds are we'll all be okay. Uh, the illusion of every age is that it's here to last forever, and it isn't. We've had some very bleak times in our history. The 1930s was a bit of a low sure. point, but you know things yeah. did change, and things will hopefully without a war. Yeah. In the middle of that. But there is two Americans. There is the American of fear, racism, and misogyny. There's also the United States that took on and fought slavery. There's the United States of the suffragettes who fought for the rights of women. There's the United States of the likes of Harvey Milk who fought for the rights of LGBT people. There's the United States of the labor movement that fought for workers' rights. There is another United States, the United States of the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King. And in the end, that is the United States that's going to be victorious. Donald Trump is not the United States in its totality. And the United States of hope, justice, and equality will vanquish Trump and all he stands for. It will. I think that we have an opportunity to recognize that people are waking up. The 99% when we say that, I said this a few minutes ago in another talk, 99% is a very real number, it's a very real thing, and a lot of people have been suffering for a long time in our country. And there's been false ideas and false ideals about what living life in America looks like if you do not live a privileged life. And I think what we're going to see now is we're going to see people uniting for the first time in a long time. People who come from different backgrounds, people who practice different religions, people who have different color skin. They're going to unite because they have to, because they have to stand up in the face of adversity and they have to say enough is enough. Not only are we done with the suffering and we're done with the suppression, but we're also ready to move forward in a way that's healthy and provides for all of us and in a way that we can be empowered to hold our politicians, again, accountable um, in a way that doesn't, isn't detrimental by choosing candidates like Trump in the future. Right, thanks, guys. We're off. Thank you very much.